Cashflow Diary Podcast, episode 148. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jay Massey, your host. Welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. Hopefully you are as excited as I am. If you took a glance at the show title, and I know most of you don't, you just hit the subscribe button and whatever comes in, that's what you're listening to. Today, we're going to talk about something that I think nearly every person on the planet needs to hear. So that's also code for share this episode with as many people as you can possibly find because nearly everyone you run into wants to achieve what they call retirement. Now, if you saw me in person right now, you would have seen the air quotes, but because I'm guessing that your definition of retirement is going to change as you listen to this particular episode, because today's guest expert has a different view, and most importantly, we're here to share it with you. So just think about this idea. Many of us, when we think of the word retirement, we're probably thinking things like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to eat beans so that I can eat beans later. And I'm like, no, 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 you don't want to do that. At the end of the day, today's guest says retirement is possible. In fact, not only is it possible, it's probable, and you can still live well today without sacrificing tomorrow. So you got to understand, we're actually talking to someone who has experience and been able to do this for 25 years. That's called a really, really long time and has all the credentials to back it up. Help me welcome Mr. Roger Whitney. Roger, you there? Jay, how are you? I am excited. Glad that you are here. Now, you call yourself the retirement answer man. That means I have to be the retirement question man today. There you go. There you <laughs> go. go ahead and ask. Yeah, you know, I've, I've got a big <laughs> job ahead of me because there's so many people right now who probably have so many questions about, like, how to retire and what's retirement and all these things that I'm sure you get all the time. Now, before we go there, though, I, I've got a, I've got a question for you. And in fact, most people already know where where I'm going with this. I look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes, you know, Batman, Robin, Wonder Woman, Hulk, yeah. whoever you like. Because he superheroes, they go around, they transform themselves in various ways and save people. You know, they, they usually from their own mess. And many people would probably argue that the reason they're unable to retire is because they created the mess in the first place. But at the end of the day, that, as an entrepreneur, what we do is we get to go around and save people and improve their lives using the skill sets and talents and the ideas that we know and come up with. However, before we put on our first cape or mask, we're just ordinary people. Uh, we have an alter ego, if you will. So what I would love to know is, is before you put on your cape and mask and started swooping around for the last 25 years and saving people and helping them retire, who is Roger Whitney? Oh, oh, Lord. Yeah, that was a challenge I was not expecting. Good. <laughs> Who am I? I'm a man on a journey. I mean, I'm just trying to figure it out like everybody else. And I'm very successful at it because I screw up a lot. <laughs> yes. To learn from everything I've made mistakes. I'm 48 now, and so I feel I'm starting to feel older. And one of the nice things about getting older is you start to have perspective because I have lots of scars. I have some wins, but I have lots of scars and they they teach me and they give me perspective. So I guess that's who I am. Yeah. Perspective. It's something that I'm I'm on this journey of gaining. I think I, I've been saying to all my friends that the last year has been the year of Jay growing up finally. So it's like, that's what it feels like, you know, as I, I crossed uh, 40 finally. And I'm just like, hmm, here we go. It's time to grow up. I've got I got a kid in college, man. And I'm in it. It's like, what is that? How is that possible? Anyway. 
Well, I'll give you like a, a quote that I it was something I tell people when I when I enter an engagement. One of the first things I say is, "Now let's get something clear. I have absolutely no clue what's going to happen in the future." <laughs> <laughs> so now that we have that on the table, we'll have to figure out how to manage through it. <laughs> totally. Right. How can I guarantee that my retirement is going to be safe? I'm like, uh, you're talking to the wrong guys. I don't know that that's possible in it, any way, shape, or form. So help us understand, how do you wake up one day and go, I know, I'm going to help people with their retirement? Well, it was a, it was an evolution. I've done this is all I've ever done is work in the financial planning industry, and that's a long and really there's a lot of scars from that because it's a hard industry, and in a lot of ways, it's not a good industry. Um, but where where I came to focusing on dealing with that transition to a more independent life is well, one that's where most of my clients are. They're thinking about those things, and that's where. You're entering that midlife crisis phase of what is the rest of my life going to look like? <laughs> and how am I going to make it work? And right. it's a really critical period of time. And, and I was influenced really early because my mother um, worked very hard. I was a, she was a single parent. She had the obligation of taking care of myself and my two sisters. And she was one of those people that sacrificed her life with the promise that I will enjoy myself later on mm. when, when after I've taken care of all this stuff. And for her, that later on never came because she passed away when I was 22. Oh, no. So I think a lot of us feel so intimidated about the future that we sacrifice the only life we have for some idea that might not ever come. So there's got to be a way of finding some balance between taking care of tomorrow and still enjoying and being alive in the present. Totally understood and, and and well said, if I may say so myself. At the end of the day, then, I, I like, first of all, what you called it as a transition to a more independent lifestyle, which completely begs the question, when you think of the word retirement, what is its definition? What does that mean? Well, so... So I'm a, I'm on a deadline. I have I have a book that I'm working on that will be done hopefully by mid March. Okay, that's <laughs> called for August. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Just say it. <laughs> we always, especially with the book, it takes longer than it's supposed oh, I'm to. Already overdue. I'm already overdue. But the the working re- working title of it is Screw Retirement. And what I mean by that is screw that ideal or that current concept of retirement of the photos that we see in all the marketing material of sitting on the beach and walking down. <laughs> and the reason I say you get a you know, screw that concept is because one, you're going to live a lot longer than you realize. You're going to be a lot healthier than you realize more than likely. And if you embrace that traditional concept you'll never be able to make it because you'll have to save such a huge pile of money. You will be eating beans and rice right now and in the future, like you said. <laughs> so yeah, that's the kind of concept we need to unembrace. And that's the one that's marketed to us. So that's sort of how the issue is framed. And the only solutions offered for that old style of retirement is you better save more, meaning sacrifice your life now, or you're going to not have a great life later on. And I think that's a really poor way, a poor choice set for people to deal with. And I think people know that's not how it's going to be or that they're going to live that more. I'm just retired and I'm done working. It's going to be a lot more independent than it is what that traditional concept is. You know, it, the thing is, is uh, many people know and, uh, that I was previously a, a financial planner. And this, what you just said is what was driving me nuts is the fact that every time I tried to sit down with somebody, I was like, here, this is all you have to do. Save this incredibly amount of money from a budget that you don't already have, and you'll be completely fine, which is code for saying, you're not going to make it. <laughs> you yeah, know? you're screwed. You're screwed. So, and, and then what happens is people just tune out and they don't do anything. Right. And, and that's not being very intentional. So my concept of retirement, and this is my plan, is I am as accepting, I'm 48, I'm accepting that I am going to work probably till at least 70. But 
I'm going to work more on my own terms. Meaning, and so rather than have it be this big Mount Everest that you have to build this big pile of cash and then check out and then be happy, I I would liken it more to it's a journey where I don't have to build this big pile of cash because I'm managing my cash flow and I'm going to have more cash flow for longer if I'm intentional about how I structure my life and my business and things like that. So right now I feel retired in a way because I'm just having a blast serving the people that I serve and and I'm still able to have that balance because I'm already accepting I'm not going to retire at 60. I'm going to continue to work, but more on my own terms. You know, I think right now, many of our listeners now just figured out this is why Jay has him on the show today (laughs) is because I am the exact same way. We call it piles of cash versus streams of cash. And at the end of the day, it's easier to create streams of cash than it is this massive pile that then that for most people is like we can't save up faster than they can print, but we can create current streams of cash significantly faster. And, and we all know that I, I, I lend towards real estate because that's the thing that has the ability to do it, but it's not the only thing out there. And that's exactly why I like you. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, you get it. It's not. Oh, they it's, like me. They really like me. Yeah, totally. It's like, <laughs> there's no way to get there with the traditional thinking. I mean, between taxes and inflation and the vehicles that are available, it's like, good, good luck. However, if you begin to change the way you think, you can use those same vehicles in different ways. So I would love to know, how did you evolve? That's what I look at it as. How did you evolve to that realization? It took time. I mean, I drank the Kool-Aid. I mean, I grew up in the financial planning industry, and I think it's just maturity. And I consider myself more of a business person than a financial guru. And when you look at all the levers that a person has in their life, investments are important, but they're just a line on a balance sheet. And I, it just came from, I study a lot. I'm a nerd. You saw all the initials behind my name. I'm just a nerd and I noodle on this stuff all day long. That's true. I did see all those initials. Uh, in fact, it's it's not quite 26 letters, but it's definitely long. And I'm just like, wow, I didn't even know that those letters go together, but they are together. So speaking of initials and, and all of these things, I, I guess, what do you think is more valuable these days when it comes to you know, seeking out someone who has the answers? Should they be looking for those initials? Or is there something else that you've learned is is actually more beneficial to actually help someone find the answers that they're looking for when it comes to this overwhelming and often intimidating subject of retirement? Well, in, in terms of financial advisor? Yes. You, ooh, I have now. I have a worksheet that has fifteen questions w- that you should ask a financial advisor, and traits that you should look for, and how to do research on them. So I can share that with you. I can email that to you afterwards if you want to uh, put that in the show notes. But that would be a good start. Initials are important if they're the, if they're good initials, because as you know, there are a lot of you know <laughs> uh, certifications that aren't necessarily as rigor- rigorous as others. Right. Um, but the problem with the certifications are that they teach the traditional retirement planning model that the financial industry has embraced. So as an example, I'm a certified financial planner and I taught part of that curriculum at the university of Texas at Arlington. And I taught the retirement planning section and the retirement planning section, the official retirement planning process is literally what we just talked about. It's determine how much you're going to need when you retire, look at what assets you have, figure out what the gap is, and then figure out how to save and invest to hit there. So it's exactly that old model that we just we just talked about. It doesn't talk about creating income sources or thinking like a business person might think. And I think, so the certifications don't necessarily get you someone that gets the more multidimensional retirement planning that you and I are talking about. Right. And that's that's the journey that we've been on and and thus the name, you know, the of the the brand and everything is it's all about how can you create cash flow. There are many different ways to do it. I mean, some of you listening probably if you if you've got skill sets at, at vocal 
uh, skills, you know, singing, et cetera. You know, you, you get royalties on these things and that could be your stream of cash flow, but then you also have to figure out other ways to protect and grow and all these other things. And then someone like, you know, Roger can be hyper helpful in, in those types of situations. Let me ask you this from your perspective, what is the number one thing that you believe keeps people from trying to even consider preparing for retirement in any way, shape, or form? Well, there's, I think there's two things. Can I, can I give you two? By all means. Uh, okay. You're just an overachiever, too. So we'll add that to the list. Yeah. I like I'm it. I'm compensating, I guess. I feel insecure. Um, <laughs> number one is I think that they're intimidated because they're, it, the messaging that they get is that you better start in how all the different things they have to worry about. Right. So one, it's intimidating. So they're like, well, it's, I, I'm not going to be able to do it. So forget about it. So that's number one. And number two is, and I'm a big believer of this, and this is where I think people like me can add value is we don't want to, we don't want to talk about this stuff. We're too busy living our life. Right. Mm. And there's these certain periods in, in life when we have, I call them pressure points where we come out of and we wake up and say, I need to deal with something. A good example is when you have your first child, Hmm. more than likely you never think about life insurance until you have your first (laughs) child and say, wow, if I die early, I need to make sure they're taken care of. That's a pressure point that makes you address the issue. Beyond that, you don't even want to think about it. And and it took me a year and a half to do my retire or my, excuse me, my estate plan. Oh, don't say that word. Sorry, nice. wife. I hope my wife's not listening to this oh. episode. Keep going. Skip over that part. Jay, no, I'm <laughs> slowing down now. I'm going to hammer you on this because oh, no. who wants to fill out? Have you ever filled out an estate plan questionnaire? Yes. And then I get discouraged, depressed, and quit. But go keep going. Yeah. Well, I did the same thing. And this is, you know, part of what I preach, but it took me a year and a half because I would take that thing home. I'd sit with my wife and I'm like, well, I'm here. I want to enjoy my kids. I'm not going to die today. I'm going to enjoy my kids and my dog and everything else. So it wasn't a pressure point for me. So that's the other reason is we know these things are out there, but we got other stuff going on. They seem far away. They, they, well, that and that's always the challenge is that it does seem far away until it's not. And then you're like, oh, no, what do I do? There's uh, your first point. And then they go look for somebody. Yep. 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 Yeah. Now that that estate plan thing, that one's a doozy. <laughs> I mean, when it's like just trying to keep track of once you start collecting assets, that's what I, how I look at it. Once you start collecting assets, trying to keep track of that and then inventory and then put it in this and who's going to deal with what it's, it's emotional to it is. say the least. It's like, who's going to get your kids? I don't know. I don't want to think about it. Move on. And you know, that's it's, it is definitely. So how does someone, you know, cause I'm, I'm guessing I'm just going to take a stab you know, there, there are tens of thousands of people listening probably right now. <laughs> So, because you're so popular, Jay. well, it, it maybe, <laughs> maybe not. I, I think they they just really have a genuine need to figure this thing out. And at the end of the day, how how do they? How do we get past that uh, that anxiousness feeling? Because you you hit it right. When a kid comes, there it goes. When you, you know you start uh, building assets, you got the estate plan thing. And then the I know for me recently, it's been oh my god, my oldest is in college. This is different and. It's like if she has a problem that it, it it just changes the dynamic that you have to operate within. How does one handle all those things? And heaven forbid, should they also have on top of that an, an elderly parent that they got to take care of at the same time? Well, exactly. Exactly. I mean, there's so many variables that you can't figure out. And uh, so how do you, whether you're 20, 30 or 50, mm-hmm. you know, there's so many variables. I mean, we're all just sort of muddling along trying to you know, keep, keep a a good course. So the way I approach it is now I'll use the, uh, uh, analogy I always use. So how long have you been married, Jay? Um, wow. Just put me on the spot like that, man. Uh, it's all good. It's all good. It, this is going to be our 12th year. Okay. Okay. And you tell me the secret to a good marriage. Lots of prayer. (laughs) <laughs> and forgiveness. <That> <laughs> there is nothing else. <laughs> and everybody has a different answer, right? And so my answer is always, and I've been, I'm, this year will be 25 years. Um, and forgiveness is good. For me, it's a little bit more pragmatic in that, and I don't practice it all the time well, is 
My secret to a good marriage is I never want to have a big conversation with my wife. If oh, I can okay. avoid big conversations, I'm doing good. And what that means is I have lots of little conversations. So we're walking hand in hand spiritually and mentally and value-wise. So we don't start – because what has, happens is people live – separate lives in their head, right? <laughs> and if you don't have little conversations to make sure you're in harmony with your spouse, I've I've dealt with these things. You can have divorces. They don't even know why they're getting divorced. There's just so much resentment built up of things that were not addressed when they were tiny that uh, it blows up. Well, your financial life is exactly like that in that we have no clue what's going to happen in the future economically or in the world or in the market or in real estate or whatever. But just as much as we don't know anything about that, we have no clue what's going to happen in your life, Jay. Five years from now, the things that you care about will probably be totally different than you can imagine today. <laughs> and evolve as a person. You're going to be a different man then as you evolve. Right. So rather than try to figure all this out and get so intimidated, what I focus on is how do you have lots of little conversations and make sure they're the right conversation so you're in tune financially with, with the things that you and your, your spouse actually care about? And it's a lot like running a business. You're talking about, okay, what's our objective here as a family over the next year and three years? What is our cash flow situation? And is it good? And then how do we create more free cash flow? And then what do we do with that free cash flow, your balance sheet or your net worth statement? And then what risks are out there in our life? And then how do we address those? And then what's our giving plan ultimately? And then you just keep having conversations on those areas over and over again. And that's what I do. I drive the conversations. I facilitate them. So the people I work with, they just show up. And then we just muddle through life together, managing the uncertainty rather than thinking we have to figure it all out. Yeah. And that, that uncertainty thing is huge because uh, how many people ask you for guarantees? <laughs> well, <laughs> See, well I, 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 I can't even say that word back to you. I'm not I, know, to. I know, I know. That's, that's kind of the funny part of me saying that to you. Uh, <laughs> it's like he, but I'll he, tell you how I deal with that, though, when people want certainty. And, 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 you know, the clients will either, you know, people will either self-select themselves or not. But what I tell people in, as we're going towards retirement, I was like, okay, John, I'll say, Jay, I can't guarantee you're not going to live in a, a trailer at the end of this. And, I, and I've said this to people that live in, you know, multi-million dollar homes. I'm like, Jay, I can't guarantee you're not going to live in a trailer because the world could just go totally wrong. Everything bad could happen in your life. And it just... And if it does, if we have that perfect storm, you could be living in a trailer. But what I can tell you is if we have these little conversations consistently and are diligent to it, you're going to be downgrading so many times along the way that it's not going to be that big a deal <laughs> because we're going to be making all these little adjustments. And you'll, you'll, everybody else will be in the same boat, but you'll be one of the last people to move into a trailer. Because most people will ignore it and then all of a sudden wake up and have a huge conversation, sell their million-dollar house, and be broke. But if you're diligent and you have a repeatable process, you'll be making so many little adjustments along the way. It won't be that big a deal. You know, I, I like this concept of having small conversations. I, you know, what, talk to your wife tonight, aren't you? I was getting to say, I was like, you know what? It's okay for my wife to listen now. She can now <laughs> listen to this particular episode. This is good, good stuff. So. With with all of that being the case, because the the <laughs> this whole concept of you know retirement and you being you know uh, you know as the superhero that you are, saving people, giving us answers. What at what point do you really go? This is something I want to do and help people. How did you develop the courage to be the guy that people can come to? for those answers? Because that's a lot of responsibility for any entrepreneur, let alone on the subjects like, you know, you know, it's one thing to say, hey, you know what? I know I got a great idea. I'm going to make pens. Well, if the <laughs> pen doesn't work out too well, it's not that big of a deal. This is retirement. It's a completely different emotional thing. How on earth do you develop the courage to be the guy willing to stand in that gap? Are you tired of letting good cash flow generating ideas go to waste? 
go to cashflowdiary.com forward slash ready to apply for a complimentary, yes, that means free, one-on-one breakthrough session. Take action now. Go to cashflowdiary.com forward slash ready. Again, that's cashflowdiary.com forward slash ready. Before we get back to today's episode of the Cashflow Diary podcast, your host, Jay Massey, has some important insights to share with you. Have you noticed that one of the necessary ingredients for you to go out there and become the bigger, better, better entrepreneur and put on your superhero cape is, well, courage. Do you understand what that is? Do you get it? Uh, At the end of the day, it's okay to be afraid. It's just not okay to let fear stop you. And you can go out there and become all of the things that you've heard every one of these entrepreneurs that we've been introducing you to, you know, become. If if you really, really want it and really, really want it, you know what that means? That means you're willing to deal with the ups, the downs, the discouragements, the people that say no, the people that tell you yes, but really meant no, and the people that said no, that really meant yes, and everything that tends to happen in between. You got to be committed to becoming a bigger, better version of yourself, and that's what you hear often in with a lot of these interviews. You guys can do it. That's why you keep listening, I I think. Anyway, I want you to hear the rest of this one. That's a big question. And I was supposed to ask little questions? No. (laughs) uh, Well, there's a couple things in there. One, I've been a financial advisor for a long period of time. And I would say definitely in the early years and you know, the way financial advisors are trained is horrible, horrible. So I was not a very, I didn't add a lot of value for a very long period of time because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Excuse me. Um, so there's that. And there's that, wow, if I'm doing this and I think I've iterated myself and changed enough that I actually, I'm highly trained. I have enough experience mainly because I've screwed up so much because I didn't know any better. Right. And I still have a lot to prove. So I'm at my sweet spot in my profession. And I spent about a year, this is going to sound silly now, but I, I could have easily coasted as a, in a, as a profession and made good money and had, you know, had fun and look back you know, 15, 20 years from now and say, okay, that was fun, but what did I really do? So I spent about a year really having that midlife crisis of what's this all about and why am I here? And I made the decision through a lot of prayer, a lot of coaching and other things, you know what? I was put on this earth to be doing exactly what I'm doing right now. And I need, I'm highly trained and I own it and I can do it. And I just have to be bold and this needs to be done. So that's how I came to where I'm at. That's why I lay, I'm I'm the retirement answer, man. I'm going to help people change the perception of retirement so they can find that balance between living well today. And that may sound really corny, but in a lot of ways, I'm on a mission from God on this. <laughs> yes. Uh, for those of you who didn't get that, that's a Blues Brothers right? <laughs> Um, which is probably something, a movie that came out long before your iPod. But that's okay. <laughs> uh, keep this in mind. It, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, we all have to draw inspiration from somewhere and it's good to know where that comes from because we need it in order to go out there being an entrepreneur is risky fraught with uncertainty not for the lighthearted and you definitely have to find a way to stay grounded so what would you say at this point um is like is is there a top three things everybody could do to and i'm not going to use the word guarantee but put the (laughs) odds more in their favor to actually be successful at making it to any version of retirement? Don't think it's an investment solution because it's not. It's a behavior solution. It's managing your cash flow and creating free cash flow in your life, which goes to stuff that you're talking about. It's just like a business. You got to create free cash flow. And then rather than think of it as an investment solution, Use your net worth statement as your your core document into allocating that free cash flow to serve what you and your family care about most and have those little conversations. And if you don't think of it as an investment solution, then you're going to start to think more creatively of how do I increase my free cash flow? 
how do I find more joy and experience than, than things? And those are the types of things that will really drive you to having a longer life where you're productive rather than thinking you have to save this big pile. Correct. That, oh, that I can remember so many times telling people what, how much was in that pile and just seeing the discouragement on their faces, you know, to get there. So, well, I guess then you're the retirement answer, man. So riddle me this, Batman. What is the number one thing someone listening right now could do to begin to make that shift? Right man. now, right now, before this episode is over, what's that thing they could do? Figure out what you're supposed to be doing and think of yourself as your own individual business and start treating yourself that way. Whether you work for a corporation, nice. McDonald's, or you actually run your own business, you are your own business. You incorporated. Love it. It Absolutely. really is. <laughs> Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, that's really how it is uh, when it comes down to it. We just have this you know, illusion that we have that safe, secure, stable job thing going on at the end of the day. Now, I, I, I got a question because you've hinted at this a number of times, but you said you, you talk about managing cash flow. And I know for somebody like me, uh, you, when you hear managing cash flow, you translate that into the word budget, which then gets translated <laughs> into the word handcuffs, which then gets translated into the words beans and rice. And all of these images begin to go. And just so that you know, we don't use the word budget in the household. We use resource allocation plan because that has less negative connotations to it than the word budget for me. <laughs> So for those of us who might not necessarily like our resource allocation plan, what would you say? How do we manage this cash flow if we don't even like this process? Okay. I'm a financial guy, and I'm going to tell you straight up, budgets suck. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I hate budgets. So I'm going to – and this is how I – I'll tell you exactly how I manage my cash flow. I do not keep a budget. So, and I save a lot of money. And the way that I do that is at the end of the day, I don't want to be a bookkeeper. I got too many other things I want to do in my life. I don't care if my eating out category is high or low for any given month. So what I did, and this is just out of hating budgets, is I have a a, a simple process for managing my cash flow. I I did some forensic accounting and said, okay, what do I roughly spend over a three or four month period. So you have to do a little bit of work on the front end. And I came to a number. Okay, just for as an example, let's just call that $8,000, just as an example. Okay. So if on average, my household spends $8,000 a month, and let's say on average, I earn $12,000 a month, just to keep numbers easy, most people will have their income go into their spending account. And then whatever's left over, they save. What I do is I have all of my income come into a separate account. I call it my income account. And then once a month, I transfer at the beginning of the month, I transfer over $8,000 to my checking account. And I spend that to zero every month. And I don't really care where it goes. And then towards the end of the month, I start to feel a little poor. And then every now and then you'll have these one-off events you know, these extraordinary events, which there always, always seems to be something. <laughs> and then when those happen or when we're overspending for some particular reason, my wife and I will have a little conversation and like, oh, we probably need to transfer a little bit more over because this happened and that happened. And that's no big deal. But it captures my cash flow, my excess cash flow in a separate account so I don't just flit it away. And then I still can access it if an extraordinary event happens. And then if you find that you're doing that consistently, then you have to go back to step one and figure out what that monthly number is again, because maybe you underestimated it. Got it. So I don't pay attention to any category. So that's the simplest way I figured, because the real goal with a budget is to capture that free cash flow, that excess cash flow. So Got it doesn't it. matter what category goes in. You know, if you, you, the word budget eventually becomes a curse word. You keep cursing a whole lot. 
<laughs> the, I like it. Rating in iTunes now. I know, right? <laughs> it's gonna have to change. The the and this process is I I like what you said. You're keeping it simple. That's very clean. That's very clear. Um, it, it actually sounds a little bit more doable than than most things that I've heard. Um, and I'm sure there's probably someone actually rejoicing that you at least were willing to admit that budgets suck. And <laughs> I think we're going to start a new website, budgetsuck.com. You know that there it is, and and that becomes the foundation of everything uh, everything else that's required now. When you are, are going through this process, because I, I think this is something that plagues a lot of specifically real estate investors and definitely business owners, you're always thinking about the next step. You're always thinking about how to continue to gain that leverage and to to do the next deal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea of actually having that 4000 or 10000 or even 40000 or 100000 whatever the number is for you off to the side, quote unquote, doing nothing doesn't exactly sit well with most. Now, I, as I said earlier, there's been this, this whole thing, you know, Jay growing up thing over these past couple of years that it just feels like, okay, I get, I, I kind of get it more why you want to do that, but help us understand how important those cash reserves are and how it's not really just doing nothing. Yeah. And I, and, and, you know, I, I, I do, I ha- and personally, I do real estate and I have a lot of clients that are in the real estate industry and are, are deal junkies. <laughs> hey, 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 I take my medicine. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good though. Uh, and, and with real estate, leverage is a lot of it, right? Yeah. At, at least traditionally. So real estate investors and business owners because man you know I'm a business owner and then, man any dollar I invest in my business I I feel like I have more control over what my uh IRR is going to be than anything else right um so having cash reserves feels very wasteful especially for real estate people because there's always deals and there's always leverage and the numbers the performers always look great right oh they that's exactly always. how it happens too didn't you know I've never seen one that <laughs> didn't look good. It's amazing. Uh, but anyway, um, and it does, feel, especially with a zero interest rate environment, but cash flow or cash reserves are critical. Oh, they're so critical. And that's a hard thing for an entrepreneur or a real estate person to get because life happens. And it's like life's airbag, right? And you don't know when you're going to need it. And an airbag costs a lot of money believe it or not. And when it's there, it saves you. And although we've seen time and time again, people that run into financial issues, it's because of a lack of liquidity. And I personally know someone that was a billionaire that literally lives on the streets now here in Texas because gotten himself into a liquidity crunch and lost it all. It goes away very quickly because when you're when you're using leverage or you have you don't have any liquidity it doesn't take much of a downtick in values to blow everything up and we can understand that intellectually but even the, if you understand it intellectually putting that cash aside and having it sit there earn maybe 1% is maddening especially for a business owner or a real estate person got it yeah you know you've you hit on two things that i have uh, that i definitely want to highlight the first and more simple one though that i would love for you to explain because i know i get the question but i want to hear it in your words and as simple as possible you said when that that dollar invested in the business uh, gives you the con- more control over your irr now proceed i i i understand what you mean but Will you please share with everybody what is IRR? <laughs> In, internal rate of return. So for the dollar that I put into my business, if you manage your business where you track matrix, you can, you have an idea of what incremental return you're going to have on every dollar you put into your business. Thank you. And then you've hit on this a couple of times. And I... Um, I've been learning more and more deeper how finances and the the concept of retirement uh, is more about behavior than it is. A, it's it's not a math problem. It's a behavior problem uh, in in a very 
clear way. And I, and I think the behavior that, you know, uh, real estate individuals, myself included, have to learn to do better at more and more is this whole concept of cash reserves. I was just curious as to how would someone, um, in your opinion, be able to master that, that particular part of the skill? Because it, clearly it's critical. Self-discipline. I don't know. Got it. it and it's that simple. Take two of these, call me, take two self-discipline pills and call me in the morning. And it's maddening seeing cash sit there when you have, as a real estate person, a ton of deals come by. <laughs> no comment. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, until you learn uh, until you learn better financial uh, ways of being. And that's one of the things my CFO is constantly drilling into my head. And, and fortunately, you know, you, you eventually learn to listen and, and change so that you can continue to grow the business, et cetera. And I, someone explained it to me this way. He, he simply said, Jay, it's not that the money isn't doing anything. It's doing something. It is standing there like a, dut- a dutiful, faithful little soldier protecting everything else you've already done. That is a very good way of looking at it. When he told me that, I relaxed a little bit. It was like, okay, all right, that makes me feel better. Somebody is standing guard, and there they go. Good little soldiers. And it made me feel better because uh, they definitely don't multiply in any way, shape, or form in today's interest rate environment, but they do sit there and guard. And that's, all right, all right cool. I can live That's with a that. very good way of saying it. I like that. I'm going to steal that. That's good. Yeah, no, hey, it, it, it freed me, and it, it, hopefully it'll free a few more people because I was, I don't, I don't like it. I, I don't, it, it was not something that you, you go, well, it's just sitting there and it just bugs you in the back of your head uh, all the time. But so the concepts that were, you know, you were talking about you incorporated, the idea of uh, thinking yourself as, as your own business, even if you are, actually work for someone else, what would you say um, is the, the most common things that when someone walks into your office, you're like, you know, here are the three things that I know we're going to have to fix no matter what so that they can begin to manage their own life like a business. It's having those conversations because most people have no clue of their cash flow or no understanding of what their net worth is. And, and I'm amazed by that. <laughs> He's like astounded. You don't know. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Excellent. And uh, was that, that's it? Like what if say someone does know what what then what what are they supposed to do or how do they interpret that information because I always think it's a process it's data to information to interpretation and 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 most people as you're saying don't even get as far as the data part let alone the next step right well um, so the things I go through I'm like a wind up dial Jay I go through the same conversation over and over whether they get it or not. So we always start off with, okay, what are we trying to accomplish here? And let's define what that ideal is. And most people have a hard time even knowing what they're trying to accomplish in the next year or three years from a financial perspective, much less retirement. So we just, I call them tiki dolls. We start setting up tiki dolls that we can knock down. Nice. And when we and then we just continually do that. So we set up the one year. Okay, what's our theme for this year from a financial perspective? And we we set what that is, and then we work like a project throughout the year to knock those down. And those are all the one year goals. Generally, drive the three, and then the long term goals. So we that's part of the meandering process. But most people just don't have that concept of what even they're trying to accomplish. This is true. Now, is this the, 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 so do the tiki dolls like have different color skirts on think, or whatnot? <laughs> I need just, to get some and get some balls in my uh, conference room so we can throw them at them. Yeah. I'm just sitting here thinking that's one way of uh, memorializing the progress that you're making. It is, isn't it? it? It would be, it would be an interesting thing. And then when people are getting to that point, so I generally end up getting engaging with people when they're at that point that they're wondering what their end game is. Right. They're 50 and or they're 50 and older, 45 and older, and they're wondering what that end game is to where they can slow down running a little bit, but still be engaged. And probably the biggest issue I have with them in thinking, okay, what is that end game is everybody wants to be so reasonable in what their expectations are because they realize how the 
rough the numbers are that, that we've talked about. So they end up being really reasonable when I ask them what their dreams and aspirations are. And that really frustrates me. So a big challenge for me is I push people to tell me everything. Give me the ideal. And it's very hard for people to think that way nowadays. And it's so important that you start off thinking really, really big when you're going towards those more independent years. Because unless you think really big, and nine times out of ten, when we do the analysis, it is way too big. But that gives you a framework to start to prioritize the ones that you actually care about. Got it. So and, and, and so that we're all on the same page. When you say being reasonable, I'm going to interpret that as people just say things like, you know, if I could just make sure I keep my house and eat every day, that'll be fine. Exactly. But what you're really wanting them to say is, well, I'd like to live on a cruise ship uh, six months of the year and make sure that I can take my family with me. And oh, by the way, if I could occasionally go to the Olympics, uh, that would be good too. A whole laundry list of big things that are dreams and aspirations. Because if you don't do that first, then you can't prioritize. Right. God forbid you're reasonable and you die with too much money. That's just horrible. <laughs> yeah, I get where you're coming from uh, with that. So let me let me ask this: how does how does one develop that skill set? Because after I mean, after quote unquote being beaten up so many times, it's, it's kind of hard to go back into that that mindset of maybe I can achieve something still. It's not too late for me, and and all of those types of things. What? How do we get there? Well, you, you either you either noodle on it and you do a lot of research so you can have the framework to understand all the trade-offs involved, or you you hire someone like me, I guess. Um, and that's not a, that is that's not really a self plug, uh, but but that that is the point of we all want to make we're all trying to we're doing a calculation. I want to live as well as I can today, but I still want to make sure I'm okay tomorrow. And we're all trying to balance that teeter totter. And some of us are way too far living well today, and others are sacrificing their only life for a tomorrow that may never come. We all want to balance that teeter-totter, but we don't have a framework for understanding the trade-offs of all of the little decisions that we have to make. And that's what I try to focus on. And you know, I think some people come to that more naturally than others. Yeah, uh, indeed, indeed. Um, are you familiar with uh, the website Cloud9 Living? I am not. Okay. Uh, I'm, I, I submit this to you and to everyone because this is something I do to help me when I'm like, I'm trying to figure out what do I want to do. And it's cloud, the number nine living.com. What they are is it's just an experience company. They literally contract for all kinds of experiences. And it's one of the greatest things that can begin to plug those juices and get you thinking, well, what could I do? For example, if you wanted to to ride in an indie stock car, these guys arrange that for you, you know, for a day. If you wanted to actually awesome. drive the stock car, they arrange that for you. Uh, we're, we're talking things like uh, space, uh, near space uh, flights on in airplanes and all the crazy stuff that you probably were just not even willing to let let your mind think about these guys actually do. I mean, if you wanted to go up into an airplane and dogfight with a friend, both of you <laughs> in the air, these guys do it and they make that stuff happen for you and they do it all across the US, etc. And, you know, it it serves, I've used that site many, many times for the inspiration of, hey, this would be cool. Let's do all of these great things. And then it gives you what you're talking about there, the ability to then prioritize. Now, obviously, I have this fascination with things in the air. So some of that go fast. So some of you are like, I don't want to do that. Okay, they have the cruises and the spa and the water stuff too. And the food for you foodies out there, they got all those, you know, private dinner cruises and all this other stuff too. But, you know, if if you're having trouble and you need a jumping off point, that place always works for me. I love that. I'm checking that out today. Yeah. Be, it, I, I think it'll probably help a couple of your clients. Have them like you come up with another checklist. Say, pick 50 things from this company that you'd like to do. And that'll probably help them <laughs> begin. Because there's, I mean, when you start looking at how outrageous some of the things are, you're like, 
whoa, uh, okay, you know, because they, you know, they they probably haven't thought about that. I mean, so they're, I mean, I'm sure many golfers want to go to the Masters. Well, these guys have the ability to help that happen. Pro Bowl tickets, Kentucky Derby. We're talking the crazy stuff that many people would never, ever consider. And I, I think you're right. It would help all of us. Now, would you agree with me in that when you finally get a client to do that, I think then and only then do they come alive and actually start living. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, yeah. Most of my clients, they're a particular type where they they try to be intentional. That's why they're probably talking to me in the first place. But you're right. It's it's good to have big dreams. It yeah. really is. Yeah, it, it's it's something that uh, fortunately I was. I, I was I ran into a while ago with many of my mentors helped me to learn how to do that and it just it, it gets me on fire to go out there and do as much as humanly possible and change as many lives as possible so that I I think that's awesome uh, that you're doing the exact same thing so at, at this point I'm guessing there's probably more than one person who would love to find out and and uh, you know more about what you're doing. Um, and, and where you, where you hang out. So what, what's the logical next step? How can we maybe even get access to some of the checklists that you mentioned and, 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 and find out and get some more of our own questions answered if they wanted to do that? What, what would you like us to do? Well, my home on the internet is rogerwhitney.com and that's the home of the retirement answer man. And I have a podcast, a retirement answer man podcast. And if you go to my website, all I do is talk about the things that I'm dealing with, with clients. And I have a, a, a check, a, a, a library of checklists that I use in my practice and that I use when people are dealing with particular issues, whether it's how to interview an advisor or what to do, what are the nine things you need to have in your estate plan or how to, you know, you know, how do you choose long-term care insurance, fancy stuff like that. I mean, there's about 30, 35 checklists in that toolbox that you can get access to for free. And then, there's a place where you can ask me any question you want, and I will answer you. Nice. Excellent. So what would you say to that person right now who's, who, you know, maybe they're, they're, they've put on their superhero tights, they're going out there, they're, their business is fine, they're, they're saving people, lies swooping in, you know, and, and what's like that person in their mind who's been thinking about this whole retirement plan but keeps putting it on the back shelf, uh, what would you say to that person at this particular moment? The sooner you, in my mind, the way we just, we've talked about retirement, the sooner you start planning for it in a lot of ways, and you hit on it, the more you'll be, you'll feel free to be able to live more now because you won't be worried about it so much. Yeah. Uh, and that worry robs you of the present life that you are living or at least existing in today. Sure. So uh, I definitely appreciate you taking the time to invest with here uh, us here at the Cashflow Diary. Uh, and I appreciate what you're doing. And more importantly, that you're not a subscriber to the traditional way of thinking when it comes to um, retirement plans and the, the financial planning industry. Well, Jay, you are a blast. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, uh, for being here today. You bet. All right, ladies and gentlemen, guess what? You know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean today? That means get over to rogerwhitney.com. Why? Because you know, like I know, you got something you need to take care of. That means go download the checklist, figure it out, make measurable action. Don't let another day, hour, minute go by without you taking a step in this direction. Because you know what? Nothing is promised, especially not tomorrow. So start today. I look forward to talking to you guys really soon. Until next time.